open up with the thought of um, singing this song, but I just want to say before we sing the song, I want to put this scripture up here, because when we sing songs to God, they should be to God. They shouldn't be just a song. You know, now they have what they call gospel music. Gospel music actually is to center around Jesus. It's to center around what all he's done, how he died, how he rose, whatever message he preached pertaining to the gospel. But now music has all kinds of twists and turns to it. But only God knows if people are making melody in their heart to him for what they are singing in regards to spiritual hymns and songs. So that's why we try to always stick with dealing with hymn songs a lot of time versus the contemporary songs because they are all effective. But the scripture is where my heart is always at. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart as unto the Lord. So that's when we sing. A lot of times people close their eyes when they sing because they want to tune everything out. They want to be able to feel the presence of the Lord. Some people sing because they know they got a beautiful voice and they want to show it off. Some people sing because, you know, various reasons because they're hurting and they're really singing from their emotions. And everybody has a different reason. But when it comes to God, he wants us to make sure that whatever song we sing to him, we're singing it as unto him and to him only. Make sense? So with that being said, we're going to just sing this song right here. It's a simple song. Um, give thanks <clears throat> to the Lord. We're going to sing it. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Because of what 
continue to pray. Um, let's pray for, again, I, I've been praying for China. Uh, they've really been going through a lot in China as far as persecutions, being Christians, and, and how they have been incarcerated, and they've been brutally attacked. Um, churches have been shut down, and yet they're still, through the Voice of the Martyrs, which is a magazine that I get, they are still requesting Bibles. They are still requesting that Bibles are sent over there to them so that they can be able to be strengthened by and through the word of the Lord and through his Holy Spirit. And that is really powerful just to know that there are people that are out there actually willing to die for the God that they believe in. And here we are in America, and only God knows how much we appreciate him. Here we are in America in a land that's supposed to be a free and home of the brave, but yet we see our world is changing, our nation is changing the same. But nevertheless, God is good to us. And we don't really know what it's like to really be persecuted for the name of Jesus like a lot of these other countries and these other nations do. But nevertheless, we're still thankful to the Lord. So we're going to ask you to pray for China. Continue to pray for me and my wife. Amen. And we have definitely been praying for all of you guys that are standing. We've been praying for you all week. We've been praying for you. I've been calling your names out in prayer all week. All week calling your names out in prayer. What am I praying for? I'm praying for your hearts to draw close to God. Amen. I'm praying for that you would get a mind to just say, Lord, what is it that I need to get rid of in my life that is stopping me from getting closer to you? Lord, what habits is it that I'm, I'm still not sensitive to that I really need to break that are stopping me from realizing just who you really are and who you really can be in my life? That's the kind of prayer I'm praying. I'm praying that God will deliver you and deliver me in whatever area it is that we need deliverance in, which Amen. means that we need to be set free in and we need to be cleansed in. That's how I pray when I pray for you. Yes, sir. I'm um, asking for a prayer request. Can we just pray for um, thanks to God? Can we just give him thanks in a prayer real quick? All right. Well, let's give him thanks. We're going to thank him. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Amen. 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 And we thank the Lord for that. Amen. Well, we just want to put up here that our Bible class is coming up this Wednesday, every second and fourth Wednesday of the month. And it will be one this Wednesday from 6 to 7. And we're still dealing with the focus topic of why should I attend church? Why should I attend church? And we definitely want to build a platform, a series of understanding on the importance of why we should attend church. And surely most of y'all sitting here attend church because you love to attend church, right? Amen. All right. But in, your, in the midst of you loving to attend church, I have to ask myself, is it just what kind of love do I have to attend church? Is it just see people? Is it just to hear the music? Is it just to be a part of being with the people? But I love to attend church because, first of all, I'm learning how I am to be the church of God. My body is to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that means that I just can't do anything with it and I can't treat people any kind of way because they are a part of what God is doing as well as mm -hmm. bringing their life into a mindset of learning how to serve him. So we're going to be talking about why should I attend church again this Wednesday. And I put that up there because I was so proud of Nanye. I was so proud of him when I got that message on with Bonzi Valley 2, 2027. Nanye, I, I don't have that last name together yet, so I'm going to work on it. It's one to watch long for long term because he is a man being recognized for his skill and his gift that God has given him in basketball. So he moving on forward for the Lord. His mom says she see him in the NBA. Amen. Praise God. God. I wouldn't have said that. That is something that God spoke to Oh, me. that's okay. That's that. okay. That's God okay. Like that's good. No, it's okay because people believe that. I just don't like to put that, you know? Yeah, that's okay. Don't look stuff out there because the... Uh, that's okay. All right, all right. So God saw that he's going to be in the NBA, and amen, that's with good. Purpose. With the amen. purpose. With the amen. purpose. Amen. So right. I, was, I was overwhelmed to see that, to see a young black man. It doesn't matter if he's black or whatever, but a young person that at amen. least has some kind of focus on not just the natural, but he's first of all concerned about his soul. Amen. He's first of all concerned about being Praise different, God. along with being in the world but not of the world. So we're going to be praying for him yes, because God. indeed God can use you. He used people as lawyers. He used people as firemen. He can use people as policemen. He can use you anywhere. But only God knows. And we thank God for you, Brother Nanye, being able to be a part of being used by God. And you get to see how powerful God can be in your life where you can be an example for him in the NBA. Amen. Let's give God some praise. All right. So, before we start ministering, we just want to put some 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 um, vision and goals up there, uh, which we have not been able to do up until this point, probably about a year now. But we do have a purpose for the ministry and a purpose for uh, what we're doing. It's not just about Sundays being here in this community center, uh, because we believe in God and he's going to give us a place of worship, a place where we'll have a baptism pool, a place where we can go in if I want to decide to go down to the church at 12 at midnight and just pray up. Uh, just have a city and in the church building or whatever. Amen. God's going to give us a place like that where we can have um, the things that we really desire to have according to how God is leading us to build this ministry in Aurora. But for now, this is the work of the Lord and this is the way he's starting us out. So we're thankful. And we will not despise small beginnings. And most of all, we're thankful for you. We're thankful for you. I don't know if y'all can feel what I'm saying like I feel, but I got, a, I got an emotional welling in my stomach because I really mean that I'm thankful for you being a part of what God is doing so that you can be a part of seeing for yourself mm -hmm. that God is indeed able to do exceedingly, Amen. abundantly, above all that we can ask, think, according to the power that worketh in us. So you gotta have that power, you gotta have that strength, you gotta have that mindset, you gotta have that, that belief, you gotta see what God can do. So our ministry project is community outreach, um, is what we're working on this summer. Me and my wife started it off last year. Um, sometime my son went, went, went with me. He'll be coming here one time. Maybe he'll be coming here eventually, and you'll meet him when he when he does come. Amen. So he he helps us out in ministry sometimes. So we're going to be doing community outreach ministry. We'll keep you guys posted. If you care to join us, you can join us. If you don't have a problem going out there, shaking people's hands, letting them know, or um, somebody might see you out there, y'all nine years. Hey, there's that nine year over there. Let me go over there and say, so what you doing, man? What you doing over here? What's going on over here? Oh, let me tell you what we're doing here. You get a chance to 
out to them. So God is a God of opportunities, and we want you to be a part of encountering what God can do. So we also working on a prayer clinic. My mom, uh, my wife's mother, um, she's a powerful prayer warrior. She has written two books on prayer, and they are very powerful books. Um, so we're going to be working on a prayer clinic. We know people know how to pray, and we know some people don't know how to pray, and some of us can learn how to pray even better. So just learning and causing us to want to be closer to God is a good thing. We also have a focus on the health fix, which means we're not talking about getting in natural doctors um, to check your blood and your heart. Now we're talking about a health fix that we need as Americans because we eat to die. We do not eat to live. And we need to learn how to eat to live. We need to know that our bodies are designed to heal themselves. It's not an overnight process, but it's a process that when you know, well, they say when you know better, you do better. I don't, I don't agree with that. Because some Amen. people know better and they still That's don't true. do better. That so to know better and to know you need to do better now that you know better is going to make you better. <laughs> so that's the way I, that's just came out like that. That was truth. That was truthful, though, that's wasn't true. it? And we want to deal with, uh, we're working on a, a project called Generation Now. Now, everybody that's living today, we can go back and consider what generation we in, right? Amen. But everybody that's living today, they're living in this current generation, mm -hmm. which is called Generation Now. And we need to know how to connect with Generation Now from a married perspective, single perspective, youth perspective, and a family perspective. So I'm just putting this up here. I, I have me and my wife and those of you who are going to actually be praying with us. We haven't gotten total direction on which way to go with any of this project yet, but we know that it's going to happen and we know that it's going to be successful. So we put that up there just for you guys to be able to know that this is what we're about. So before I start ministering, let me get this out of the way because it's important. And this is a scripture that I've always used down through the years in the ministry because they have so many ways of how they plead and beg people for money and all these games they play and all this. If you do this, God do that. This scripture here is what kept me going all since I've been saved. Let every man, according as he has purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So that means no matter what you give, mm -hmm. if you give it, like we put that song up there, saying your heart has unto the Lord, make a melody in your heart. If you give him with joy, if you give him because that's what you want to give God, then that's all that matters. This person might get 300 this person might get $5, but they are a cheerful giver if they're giving it with joy, if they're giving it with excitement, if they give it because they're thanking God. Our giving is a form of worship. So whatever you give, you're saying to God, I'm giving back to you mm -hmm. what you bless me to give. So you really never lose when you give God back what he has already given to you. So I put that in a different translation. It says, everyone must make up his own mind as how much he should give. Nobody should put a figure on you on what you should give or judge you for what you give. Amen. But it's important to learn how to sow. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and you go to verse number 6, it's going to talk about they that sow sparingly should read sparingly, those sow bountifully should read bountifully. So let every man give according as he has purpose in his heart. So as you plant, that's how your increase is going to come back. But however, you might plant $5 and think all you're going to get back is $5. But if you plant $5 and you get that $5 cheerfully and you start adding on to that $5, then it's going to triple, it's going to multiply. Because the law of sowing and reaping, God cannot deny his word. All right? So you got people out there that they sinners, they drunkards, they everything. But where you going, man? I got to pay my tithes. They get to the church to pay their tithes. They get to the church to get their offering. And even though they're not living for God, God still honors his word Amen. on sowing and reaping. They still can prosper in that area. But that don't mean they prosper for eternal life. Yes, honey. Can you explain the difference between tithes and offering? Tithes is a 10% offering is just what you give freely of your own. Tithes are 10% of our earnings. And as a teacher, not that you don't have to pay New Testament tithes. I have a teacher that confirmed that you do. I won't get into all of that. But tithes is 10% of what you earn, and offering is what you feel that you want to give to the Lord. So tithes is automatic that we should give. It's really not a sacrifice in the sense of we should automatically give God that 10%. But offering is a sacrifice. For me, I, what I do, I pay more than what I should pay. So when I get contracts, when I get different jobs with my painting company or whatever I do, and I get blessed, I try to double whatever I get, offering-wise and tithe-wise. 
And God has blessed his ministry because of that. We have a business account, and God has blessed us in our business account. And it was even before we had people coming in here, God was multiplying our money just to a few people. So he, he, he does what he said he's going to do. All right? So that's we just put that up there so we don't have to. Because a lot of time when I get to the ministry, I don't even hardly mention offering. And I know it's important for you guys to understand what we are, what we have to accomplish and what we're all about. So that's why we put it up there, because we are letting you know that when you give, your money is being used for the purpose of what we're going to do in the future and for where we at and how we have Bible class twice a month. We pay for that, and we pay four times a month. Uh, we pay every we pay, we pay once. A, what am I trying to say? We pay four times a month for where we at. Six. Six. Six now. Six now. So. <laughs> It's important that you guys be here when you say you're going to be here. Because of the Bible class. Because of the Bible class. Because of the Bible class. So that's, that's, what, that's all I really wanted to put out, out there to you guys. So with that being said, Maria, you feel woke? Can you help me out? Yes. All right. We make sure we keep you woke. Because she gets off of work sometimes. She goes to one service, then she comes to our <laughs> service. And I, said, I think someone else here does the same thing. And we thank God for that. We thank the Lord for that. So we're going to hold it, hold it, hold it, y'all. Wait a minute. Oh, y'all the wrong thing. I get the wrong thing. Yeah, I get y'all the wrong thing. I'll get your notes. Same thing. Okay, I'm sorry. My briefcase. Where's my briefcase at? You see it? Get that, look in there and get that vanilla fog out of there. That's my fault. I thought I took out what I didn't take out. Now your notes all mixed up? No, they're not mixed up. Cause it's in my mind. It need either way to go. It's just something to just keep me um, reminded. Yeah. Ain't depend on that. You'd be in trouble. Hallelujah. So nobody had no prayer requests. Nobody had nothing interesting that happened this week that they're going to share with us that God did for you. Or maybe you prayed for somebody and God answered the prayer and they called you. <laughs> so anything happened for anybody this week you prayed for and something? You have a prayer request. You got a prayer request. Well, we do we threw a prayer request. You got a praise request? You got something you want to let us know that happened this week or something? No, I got a prayer request. We need one for John. We need one for John. We don't have no more. No. We'll take. We're gonna do. We we'll take your prayer request at the end before we dismiss, since we already took prayer requests. Okay. Okay. What's your prayer request? Pray for God's thanks. Okay. All right. We well. We we're gonna. We're going to make sure that when we have prayer requests, you got to try to remember at that time on that prayer request to try to get your prayer request in, okay? Oh, okay, all right. So back to my question. Is there anybody in here that has anything that God used you to do this week that was a blessing to somebody? I ain't talking about monetary giving some money. I'm just saying, is there anything that somebody asked you to pray for and God answered their prayer? Or you you encourage somebody and they really appreciate what you said to them. Just just wondering. Just wondering. Your hand is up for Yeah, I remember my prayer now. Oh, we, we gotta get back to the prayer request. <laughs> we gotta get back to that. Okay, so we're gonna move on then. I just wanted to ask that question. So we're dealing with God's plan and God's purpose for our life. Yes, honey. No, we got that just, too. I'm just thankful that I'm at, at church. Yes. I was thinking about that this morning because so many places I could be. Yeah. I could be in all kinds of wrong places or places that just not giving any reverence to the Lord. Yeah. So I'm just thankful that I'm able to be in the church. Amen. Yes. Yes. So I'm thankful that my client finally slept. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. It's been a long battle. Wow. Like, they've been taking my clients off their meds, so you know, the more, the, the more they 
they take them off them as the worst of behaviors. Yes. And so we had one, I don't know, she stayed up, I don't know, she could stay up 24 hours. Mm. And so, you know, she stay up. I can't, I can't sleep. Right. You know, I can't take my little hours that I'm supposed to rest. So it's been going on for a good while now. But last night, God must have had mercy on me. Wow. Those the clients usually wake up. I have one that wake up. She'll wake up, put her to bed at 10 o'clock. She'll wake up at 12, then 1, then 2. And, she, and you know, like, because I redirect her, go back to bed, she'll keep coming out. And so this other one, they took her off her meds, and oh my God, she was waking up. And I mean, she is full force, loud. Wow. Everything on everybody to wake up, to do everything for her. I mean, she just wake up. And you know, she wake up, she's going to wake up every it's been going on for two weeks now. So last night, everybody slept and nobody got up to <laughs> five in the morning. Right. <laughs> right. You gotta promise you won't. So great. You promise you won't put no more phones than we ever there. But ask them to keep on working that out for you. Because I'm grateful I was able to get to four o'clock is my prayer time. Yeah. I'm able to get my prayer time. Yeah. Okay. Praise God. Well, those are two good testimonies. My wife says she's glad to be in church because she could be anywhere else. And I say amen to that. Amen. But we're talking about God's plan and purpose for our life. Yes. Before I go on, do anybody else have a testimony? Because I didn't ask you. I asked a prayer request. Yep. So does anybody else have a te testimony? I did not ask for that. I should have asked you that. No more testimony. All right, let's move on. God's plan and God's purpose for our life. Now, it was some of you all, most of you all was here this week, was here last week when we explained we wanted Genesis talking about how God created Adam and Eve in his image and um, how they were designed to be shaped and formed to represent him. But I'm so thankful that God didn't leave us ignorant of how to carry out his instructions and his commands for how to live to please him. You know, God give us instructions on how to please him. You all do know that, right? Yeah. It's like once you have children and they start growing up, you give them some instructions. And you let them know the consequences if they do not obey those instructions. And when they don't obey them instructions, you have to carry through on what you said you were going to do. And sometimes, I learned through coming with a family of three brothers and two sisters, sometimes it's easy to whoop some of your kids and harder to whoop some of your other kids. Because I was the type, I would just stand there and get my whooping and get it over with. But my brothers are dive under the bed, they're running around the house, and by the time my father would be out of breath, and by the time he catch them, he'd be so angry, he whooping them even harder than he would have whooped them if they would have stayed stood still and just took the whooping. But my whole point is that you have to have some you have some rules, you have to have some uh, restrictions, you have to have um, some instructions for your children to follow. And this is what God is doing. That's why I'm so glad that he gives us instructions. How does God give us his instructions? Through his word. Through his word. He gives us instructions through his word. So we don't know we don't have to be ignorant. That means in the lack of knowledge and understanding. When a person is ignorant, they don't have the knowledge they need, they don't have the understanding they need, they don't have the education that they need. But in the case of God, everybody can pick up the Bible, even if they can't read, they can get an app and they can listen to it and they can at least learn what God requires of us as far as how to please him. Now, when I thought about that word ignorant, I thought about a scripture in Acts chapter number uh, 17, uh, when the Apostle Paul, he was preaching. He was preaching in the city of Athens, I believe it was. And when Paul went to this city of Athens, I'm putting the scriptures up there um, so you can see them in case you care to read them or write them down. In Acts chapter number 17, I'm going to put it on the screen, Acts 17, verse 16, verse 23, and verse 30. So when Paul was in Athens, he was preaching, and he actually he went there, and it was a city full of adults, full of idol worship, and people that was worshiping all kind of statues, all kind of gods, and they was all in the marketplaces. They were they was philosophers, and all these people in this city. And they say now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. In other words, he was in, he felt the need to let them know that they can get deliverance, that they can get an understanding to who God really is. So when he saw the city was full of adultery, full of idolatry, full of idol worship, it was just everywhere. This was all they knew. 
In other words, this was all that they knew. And for as, as I passed by, this is what Paul said. He said, for as I passed by, I beheld your devotion, and I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. So I'm bringing this into what I'm saying, why I'm, I'm so thankful that God doesn't leave us ignorant, and we don't have to uh, um, not say we don't understand who God is, and we can go to his word, and we can get an understanding. But Paul, these people was worshiping a God that they didn't even know, and they was actually worshiping all kind of gods. They was not worshiping one God. But Paul was getting ready to introduce them to the one God. And so he had told them, if you read Acts chapter number 17, you'll get the whole understanding of what was taking place there. But God, but Paul said to these philosophers, to all these people, there was a time in the times of ignorance that God overlooked uh, how men didn't really know who he really was. He overlooked, in other words, in their blindness, he overlooked because they didn't understand who he was. But now that Paul was there getting ready to preach the gospel to the city, he was letting them know that God commands everybody, he orders, he charges people to repent. In other words, to repent, anybody know the def simple definition of repent? What does it mean to repent in, in simplicity? Yes, Kenya. So, like, when you like sin, you can like, you can like ask God to forgive you? Okay, that's, that's a confession. That's a, that's, a, that's a start of repentance. Yes, Ezra? To be born again. To be born again, okay. Godly sorrow. Godly sorrow, okay. Turn away from it. Turn away from it. Turn away from, from what? Sin, sin. Okay. What was he going to say, uh, Kenya? I think that's what I was going to say. Turn, get <laughs> all, all, of, all of those definitions, to be sorry, to be godly sorry, to turn away from it, all of that is true. In essence, repentance is a change of mind. It's a turning in, in God's direction. It's a turning your life over to God. To repent means to turn around. To turn around and go what? In the direction that God wants you to go. To turn from the habitual sins that we live to satisfy ourselves. You know what's sad is when you don't have a sensitivity or a conviction about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And some people don't have a sensitivity or a conviction about what they're doing because they never heard the truth. They never even been in a church that even told them that they was a sinner. Every church they went in, they just... To let them know God loved them. They had programs to give them stuff. They, everybody loved. Everybody embraced. The preacher said, just do the best you can. Or whatever, whatever, whatever. And they never knew no better. But once you actually know what God requires of you, and you suppress it like they did in Romans chapter number 1. When you read Romans chapter number 1, it say, having once known God, they glorified him not as God. But they worship the creature more than the creator. And then God just starts stepping back and they start like men laying with men, women laying with women. All these things begin to happen because they didn't have no sensitivity or conviction, like Kenya was saying, about their sins. So God stepped back. But when you actually have a mind to be sensitive and convicted on what you're doing that you know displeases God, then that gives you an opportunity to repent. So what Paul was saying to these people, even though they never knew the one only true unknown God, yet they knew that they was worshiping some gods, they was worshiping some idols, but he wanted to let them know, now I'm finna introduce you to the Jesus of the Bible. I'm finna introduce you to the Jesus of the good news of Jesus that can save, that can heal, that can deliver. So now when he left that city, they was without excuse. God does not overlook us when he know we know better. He'd be merciful to us. He'll be gracious to us. He'll extend his mercy. But there comes a point where God expects for us to get it. He expects for us to understand, okay, I need to stop doing this. Okay, I need to go back and correct this. Okay, I need to make sure this don't happen again. He does not keep overlooking what he knows we understand on how we should surrender to him. And that's what we're all about in building God's church and foundation. Is helping people to understand that first of all, before we get involved in activities, before we get involved in all the things that we want to do to just make sure that we build a church from the perspective of drawing people in um, to have fun or drawing people in to use their gifts. If the main thing is for all of us to understand that church is first designed for our lives to become like God created us to live. And that does not mean we're going to live a perfect life. But it does mean God did not create us to live a life of corruption and of practice sin. God did not create us to live a life of ungodliness. He created us to learn how to live a life to please him. So that's why you have that scripture on your paper in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 4. 
And it's talking, actually, when you read the whole um, chapter, actually Paul is dealing with the church of Ephesus, where the Jews there were saying that the people who claim to know Jesus, they don't really know Jesus, and they have no right trying to pray for anybody. And also, Paul was dealing with Jews and proselyte Gentiles, who the Jews said could only be a part of the God they know through circumcision. But Paul was letting them know that they should pray for kings, and they should pray in supplication, intercession, and give them thanks to be made for all men, them in authority. He went there first, because he was trying to let them know, look, don't pay no attention to these, these Judas, this Judas, this Judaism. Don't pay no attention to these ritual rules they're trying to put on you. You are converted and used to be praying for all kings, for them in authority, and all men. And then this scripture comes after that. He said, who will have all men to be saved. Now we got to stop right there. Because they say to have all men to be saved. Saved. What, is, what do you mean to have all men be saved? Because it's broke down. Then the end comes after that. But first he said, who will have all men? That don't mean that you women are excluded. That means that men was created first to be the example. So he should be the one to be the one to bring his family to God, bring himself to God. But what, what do you understand about who will have all men to be saved? Now I can just run through this and, and go to talking about how God said this, how God said that, and how that, but we want to make sure we go slow. So you can understand what we're saying to you through the word of the Lord. Who will have all men to be saved? Do anybody have an idea what this scripture is saying? It's just that he doesn't want anybody to, um, to lose their life and go to hell from off the Lord. It's not his will that any should perish. Yes, yes. But that all will come to repentance okay. and the knowledge of him. Yes, yes. Maria, what was you going to say? Pretty much. It's a salvation scripture. So, in other words, when we're dealing with God's purpose and plan, his first purpose is for us to be delivered from what? We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, when I minister to you like this, I'm not ministering to you like this because I'm trying to be harsh. I'm trying to be militant. I'm trying to be a tyrant. I'm ministering to you like this because these are the essentials that we have to understand why God wants us to be a part of his church. He don't want us to be a part of his church just to say we know him. And just to say, I believe in Jesus. He wants to be a part of his church to be able to represent him in the world, in our families, everywhere we go. And first of all, he wants me to be in his church so that I can know that I can be helped and I can be strengthened and I can be different from the person that I know I can be versus the person he is letting me show me that I can be. So who will have all men to be saved, to be delivered, to be helped, to be set free from the bondage and the desires of their sin? Then he said to come. Until the knowledge of the truth. That's why I say I thank God that he didn't leave us ignorant. He gave us instructions. So God's purpose and his plan, one of the reasons why he created the church is right there in Romans chapter number 10. He said, how should they hear without a preacher? How shall he preach except he be sent? How sweeter than the priest, how sweet, sweeter than the feet of them that preach the preparation of the gospel of peace. So God gives pastors, ministers, saints, teachers, all these, these, these people with the gifts, he gives for the purpose of building up his church. But first he wants to begin to build us up. He wants to begin to bring us to where we need to be at so that we can be pleasing in his sight. You know, I work for a lot of companies and, and I put a lot of time in for a lot of companies. But that company don't care nothing about you when it comes to you saying you got to do something personally if it has to do with you staying productive for them. Amen. They will be upset. But I hired you. And don't be on, don't be on salary because it's almost like they want to control you. And don't be on call. They can call you anytime. It's like they have control over you. But see, God is not like that. He wants to freely and willingly understand that we need his help. We need his deliverance. We need his strength. We need him and him only. He's not a God that's trying to put us under obligation. He's a God that wants to come to him freely because we realize that we need to be helped by him. So he said there is no, but that we, to come into, he will let all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. So the knowledge of the truth is his word. Who, 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 what's the truth besides God's word? Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come into the Father but by me. Now, we got to really believe that because mm -hmm. they got a lot of ways of how they see Jesus. 
But we can't see Jesus like they see him. We have to see Jesus for who he is. He is the son of God. He is the only way to get to heaven according to God's word. Then it tells us right there that we are, he would have all men to be saved and coming to the knowledge of the truth. And it is a reason why is because there is one God. The next verse in 1 Timothy 2 and 5 says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus. So he is the mediator. What's a mediator? A mediator is somebody that's the, that's, that's the intervenes. He, he helps to bring that conflict under control. Like you got people with a marital problem. They need a, they need a mediator. They need somebody that could be in the middle to help bring some peace or bring things back together. But Jesus is our mediator in the sense of we was not even able to go to God before Jesus came because all they can do in the Old Testament is to perform those ceremonial laws. All they can do is go behind the veil with the high priest once a year to offer sacrifices. But now we can come to God on our own. We can repent to God on our own because of what Jesus did and because he is the one that died for our sins. Amen? Amen. So that's very important for us to understand that God's purpose and God's plan. When God has a purpose and a plan, he has what you call an assignment for his people to do. God created us and gave us an assignment. He gave us specific tasks that we are to do and we are to walk in according to his instructions. So in other words, this life that we live, how many of you know that this world we live in, this is actually a spiritual battle? This is a spiritual battle because this is a spiritual world. That means that there are things happening that we cannot understand with our minds, but we can feel, we can see, and we know that they're actually existing because it's a spiritual world that we're living in, and the only way we're going to win this battle is we're going to have to choose to understand that it is God's way and God's way only. So when I deal with talking about this is a spiritual battle, then we have to understand that when we're dealing with a spiritual battle, we are dealing with people that believe in spiritualism. And they believe that in all these different worlds that they can take you into in their belief system, that they will give you the deliverance that you need. But we know that's not true. Because you can get into all these different spiritual practices, all these different spiritual beliefs, and you'll find yourself emptying yourself, you'll find yourself losing yourself, you'll find yourself leaving yourself. And when you come back to yourself, you won't even know that you're yourself. You become somebody else. You can become somebody else and you can grab a hold of some behaviors that you normally would not have. But God wants us to understand he has a purpose, he has a plan for our life, and his purpose and his plan for our life is only designed one way, and that is the way that he chooses to bring us into the reality of who he really is. And our example on how to please God, and our example on how to serve God is who? Jesus, Jesus, he teaches us how to serve God. He shows us how to think like God wants us to think. Of course, of course, the word of God shows us also how we ought to think the way God wants us to think. He shows us how according to God's word. He shows us through the examples of the life that he performed, the miracles that he performed, the healings that he did. He shows us how to please God. Remember what we said last week that man was created in God's image and God's likeness. Do anybody remember the example I gave of image and likeness? It has a movement, it has a form, it has a shape. It has a form, it has a shape, it has a likeness. So God, in other words, displayed himself in human form, in human shape, as a human being to show us how to please him. Because Adam couldn't do that. Adam failed God. You know, when something, can somebody explain to me, what does it mean when something malfunctions? What happens when it malfunctions? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. It just like really like, really like breaks down. Yeah. It breaks down. It's not, it's not, it's, the system is not set to be like it should be set. It's malfunctioning. There's a glitch in it. And that's what happened. The garden was functioning well. They had holiness in the garden. They had sanctification in the garden. They had fellowship in the garden. They had God in the garden. Everything was functioning well. But something disrupted the process. Mm -hmm. And when the enemy came in and offered deception, then they made the decision to think like he wanted them to think versus staying like God wanted them to stay. So now there was a glitch in the garden. That means the system was offset. 
That means something had to be readjusted. Because remember, God would never create man in his own image and his own likeness and tell him that he's going to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and then allow the enemy to come and steal away what he set in place. His plan never changed. Remember I said that last week. God's plan, his purpose never changed. His plan might change. He might have to go in another strategy direction because of the decision that people make, but his purpose never changes. So God's purpose never changed. He was going to automatically rule this world. But because the enemy came along and he threw a glitch in it and he messed around, he brought in what's called deception. He brought in a mindset that God never intended for Adam and Eve to have. That's why we have to be careful who we mingle with because the devil has disguised himself as an angel of light. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that last week with the paper I gave you when I showed you the last paper, last part of that paper talked about the gifts, remember? 17 different gifts in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. All those 17 gifts. But in those gifts, when you study the historical setting, Paul was actually dealing with people that really wasn't servants of Christ, but they was practicing spiritual gifts. But they was not operating up under God's spirit. They was operating up under their own spirit. So Paul is saying the same thing here. The enemy is all about trying to disrupt God's plan for your life through you walk, walking in deception, walking in pleasure, walking in gifts, walking in things that you want to satisfy people with impressment that you got from God that God is really not in. But at the same time, God does give gifts to his people who are genuinely walking with him and who genuinely have his spirit. But in this particular text here, Paul was saying that Satan has disguised himself as an angel like, go home and read the whole chapter. He's going to talk about false apostles. He's going to talk about false prophets. So you got to be careful who lay their hands on you. You got to be careful who speaks stuff into your life. You have to know what they really, how do you know if they really have God or not? Because for one thing, they're not going to keep putting emphasis on what all they can do for you or what all they're saying to you. They're going to somehow bring you to the mindset of understanding that Jesus had to be exalted the most of anything. People have to be told how essential it is to understand that God loves them and that he is the one that gives me the power to do what I'm about to do. It's his spirit that's giving me the guidance to do. It's not me exalting me. It's God using me. It's something about, can, have, have anybody here ever experienced somebody that came up to you and touch you or try to say something to you and you you just know that something wasn't right with them? Nobody didn't ever experience that yet? Wow. <laughs> Interesting. I have. I was in Jules and it was it was a Middle Eastern lady and she she walks around Jewel and I was in there and she said, I, I hear the Lord saying for me to anoint your feet and anoint your eyes and the Lord began to tell me to anoint your hands, man of God. She just started coming up to me just prophesying. And I knew it wasn't God. How did I know it wasn't God? Because I got his spirit. See, my spirit will not be able to judge as quick as having God's Holy Spirit. Because God's spirit is something you can't explain, but you can bear witness if something is not right with another person. Because you can sense that something is just not connected with me inside of my soul. So God's purpose and God's plan is for us to understand the only reason why he created us was for the purpose of representing him. He created us to enjoy life. He, didn't create, he created us to enjoy this world, but he didn't create us to enjoy this world and enjoy life the way we choose to enjoy life. He created us to enjoy this world the way he designed for us to enjoy life, and that is through walking according to how he shows us in his word. Adam and Eve failed their assignment. So they changed, God, the process was changed. And you know what's so, what's so powerful about it? Think about this. Adam's assignment was just one, he just had one thing he did not have to do. And that was from that tree. But Jesus came, the new Adam. And when Jesus came, he went through a whole lot more than Adam went through in the garden. He had to fast for 40 days, he had to starve, he had to suffer, he had to be crucified, he had to be lied upon, he had to be beat, he had to be abused, he had to be touched with the feelings of our infirmity, he had to take on all of our sin. Adam didn't even have to do all of that. But God's purpose and God's plan was so powerful that when Jesus came, it was really almost like when Jesus came on the scene, at the time when you read the scriptures, let's go to that scripture in Mark chapter number 1. Can you go to Mark chapter number 1 for me? We just about done for the day. Mark chapter number one, verse number, I believe verse number 14. Mark 1 and 14. 
Okay. Everybody got it? Yes. If you get, everybody got it, say amen. Amen. All right, y'all got it. Mark chapter number 1, verse 14. This is the calling of Jesus, the first disciple. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Look at what he says. In other words, it has arrived. It's here. Then he said, Repent. It's time for you all to change. It's time for you all to recognize I'm the Messiah and I'm coming for a reason and believe the gospel. Now, he, he didn't even die. He wasn't even resurrected yet. But the good news was here. He was here. The king has arrived. And the king is here. But you know what? When we read this scripture, actually, this was like a new world order. This is like a new world order. Because never before has the Holy Spirit of God actually lived inside of anybody throughout their existence and displayed itself on the outside like it did with Jesus. And as we keep reading this, we're going to find out that later on, after he made all these people follow, these disciples, he offered them to follow him, and they followed him, and they became his apostles, and later on, he blew on them and said, receive my spirit. That was just to give them a, a feel of what it's going to be like after he was resurrected, and they go back to Jerusalem and wait to be endured with the power from up on high. So now he turns around and he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. So now here Jesus is, he has to do the reset button for humanity. He has to reset everything that the enemy offset and bring everybody back into the covenant plan, the covenant will of God. So that is the reason why it is so important for us to understand that God wants us to be able to realize his plan for us is to change our lives. I'm going to close it out with just these few verses in, in, in the book of Ephesians. If you guys return your Bibles, that's why I plead with you to please bring your Bibles with you to church. Or write the scriptures down. You can go back home and read them, or you can pull it up on your electronic device. So, this is how God wants his people to live. Let's go to Ephesians chapter number 4, verses 21. We're going to read verse 21, 22, and 23 in chapter 4. Then we're going to close out in Ephesians chapter 5. So, everybody got Ephesians 4 and 21? And the theme of this is living as God's people. Look what it says here in Ephesians that Paul is saying to the church. Now, of course, these scriptures, these letters are talking to believers. But those of us that are practicing, are trying to understand what God's purpose and plan for us, God is saying this is what he expects from us as well. So that when we become believers, we'll understand how to identify why we are like we are. This is, these are, this is the teachings and these are the scriptures that has kept me for 45 years. This is how I was brought in the church, through teachings like this. Getting me to understand that I just can't do anything and expect God to just accept me and I can expect that I'm going to just make it into heaven, live in any kind of way. You know, there's a scripture in Revelation that says that him that is filthy, let him remain filthy. Him that is just, let him remain just. Mm -hmm. So that means everybody is not going to be saved. That means that you cannot live any kind of way and make it to heaven. Now, you guys, please, I will not feel slighted or disrespected or anything if you want to raise your hand and you disagree with anything that I'm ever teaching you. And you can show me in the Word where I seem to be confused. Then I open the floor to you. So in Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 21, look at what Paul said. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in him, which is in Jesus. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. If so be that ye have heard him. Now we hear it about God. We hear it about his word. And have been taught by him. They, now at that time, Paul was trying to get them to understand that even though Jesus is not here at this time teaching the church to Ephesus, because Paul understood and he knew how to live, he was just as if Jesus was there teaching them. So me teaching you what I'm teaching you about God's purpose and God's plan, what that scripture who will have all men to be saved and coming to the knowledge of the truth, and all of what we're saying to you, it is just like what this verse is saying in verse 21. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him and the truth is in Jesus. Verse 22, look what it said. Can you all read it with me, please? That you what? Uh-huh. Concerning your former conduct. Oh, 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 oh. I need to hear y'all a little bit better because y'all sound really weak. I want to make sure we understand our purpose and plan and what we got to have. God has designed it to be. Okay? So what does it say again? That you what? Put off. Yeah. Concerning your former conduct. The, what man? The old man. Okay, let's stop. 
Now, what does that put off your former conversation? The old man. What? Why? Why he sounding so? What do you mean by the old man? The former life. The former life. The corrupt, deceitful desires. The corrupt, deceitful desires. She's breaking it down, ain't she? Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Mm -hmm. That means that my desires are crazy. Mm -hmm. And even with the Holy Spirit, they still try to be crazy. Mm -hmm. That's why with the Holy Spirit, I have to watch what I look at. I got to watch what I hear because I will create a desire. Mm -hmm. And once I create that desire, then if I'm not careful, I'm going to bring some of that old man back out of me. Mm -hmm. Y'all get it? Amen. That's why appearance and attire is important for everybody. If 10 men came in here and their pegs was out and they had on spandex shirts, and I mean, they was looking good. They just come through them door. I got y'all attention right now, but they come through that door. Yeah, we come to support this service. We heard you had something going on. And if you ain't careful, you'd be like, ooh, girl, did you see that guy come here with that spandex shirt on and his muscle? Ooh, and he had that. Because we are flesh. I'm trying to make a point here. So my whole point is that that old man, we have to watch how we bring ourselves around each other because we don't want to create a desire that a person don't need to have inside of their heart. Are y'all with me? Amen. So therefore, that she put off concerning the former old man, which is corrupt after the deceitful lust, the desire. Now what verse 23 says to be what? Renewed in your spirit. Okay, let's read that. I can't hear y'all. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So how in the world is that? Can somebody give me an understanding on that? How am I going to be renewed in the spirit of my mind? Allow the Holy Ghost to lead you and guide me. Allow the Holy Ghost to, the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me. Yeah. You're going to yield to the word of God. You're going to yield to the word of God. Yes, it's plans um, in the sense that um, the, your old thoughts, you uh, put them under subjection. Okay. You know, you, you rebuke them. Yes. Okay. So, um, What's, okay. Go ahead. Anybody else? That was what I was going to say. Put out your former thoughts, your, 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 thought, your corrupt thoughts, the thoughts that, thoughts that are not God. Okay. Places that you used to go, don't go there. <laughs> okay. All of these things are going to help. Yeah. And you're, you know, renewing your mind. Yes, yes. So to renew my mind means that I have to be able to think different, right? Yeah. And the only way I'm going to be able to think different is I'm going to have to learn how to figure out how God thoughts are. Yeah. Because remember, I, it's easy to renew my mind and, and get some strength now. It's easy to renew my mind and be thinking positive. It's easy to renew my mind with God outside of the equation because I'm still a powerful being within my own spirit. If I wasn't, 1 Corinthians say the spirit of man saves the spirit of man that's within him. Mm -hmm. But the spirit of God knows no man but him that has the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, maybe we need to get it. Yes, let's get that. Let's get there. <laughs> okay, Lord, I, I spoke it now. You got to give me, show me yeah. where, how, how to remember where it said. It's in 1 Corinthians. Somebody say something? Uh, I'm going to find it for you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jesus. First, First Corinthians chapter number 2. Verse number 9. Let's start there. Because this is one here that people get overwhelmed with. But as it is written, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Everybody got it? Yes. Okay. But as it is written... Eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, neither have we entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now, people will go up. I used to take this scripture and preach it so out of order, I didn't even know it. Because it sounds like all it's saying is, it's so much good things that God has for me. My eyes have not seen, my ears have not heard. I'm, oh, God loves me so much, he's going to give me so much. I just took that verse and got stuck right there. But when I look at my Bible, the thing says maturity in Christ. Mm -hmm. So now I'm reading the same verse, and now that I learn how to inductively study, in other words, understand what the scripture is actually saying, the next verse following that, look at this. For God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. Amen. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep 
things of God. Don't have nothing to do with me seeing myself prosperous. Don't have nothing to do with me seeing myself here. Seeing, this is all talking about getting truth. Getting God's understanding of his word. Let me prove it. So we got that. For God has revealed them to us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what knoweth the things of man? Mm -hmm. Save the spirit. They'll give you some deliverance. It ain't God's kind of deliverance. They have to make you feel like you're free. Save the spirit of man which is in him. And actually, Paul is asking that question. You see, it's a question mark behind it. Yes. So what man knows the things of man? Save the spirit of man which is in him. That's the question. So you think? Mm -hmm. Even so, the things of God know of no man but the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. So that means we got to get God's spirit. Amen. And I just can't get God's spirit by saying, I want your spirit, Lord. I can't just get God's spirit by saying, I, I believe that Jesus is Lord. I have to find out what the scripture says on how to go through the process of how to get God's spirit. And I have to obey that and that only. Verse 11, for what man knoweth the things of man, say the spirit of man which is in him. We just said that one. Let's go to verse 12. For we have not received the spirit of the world. That's our spirit. But the spirit which is of God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God. So God gives us an understanding once we get born again, once we transfer our mind, once we turn, once we repent, once we surrender, once we emerge in water and go down his name, represent burial and death. And we come up and he gets a hold of our life, he gets a hold of our tongue, he gets a hold of our hearts, he gets a hold of our mind, our emotions, our feelings. Everything changes with that supernatural experience. Because when God came in bodily form, he took on all the pain that we, that we could have, we should have bared. When he came in bodily form, he took on all of the sicknesses and all the infirmities, and he took all of that to the cross. Mm -hmm. And he buried all of that in the grave. Then why do we still have sicknesses? Why do we still have diseases? Why do we still have stress? Why do we still have problems? Because God's purpose and plan is for us to return to him or is for us to surrender to him and give him our life so we can learn how to please him and then begin to practice everything that we saw Jesus do. That's why when I pray for people, I'm... You know what, I, I can, I've read so many books on healing, so many books on praying, so many books on all this, but you know what, I was in prayer one day and the Lord just showed me, just do it just like the words say. Mm -hmm. If Jesus did it that way and it worked for him, that's all I got to do. Mm -hmm. All he asked a man, do you believe? He said, I believe, take up your bed and walk. He, he looked at the man who, who then he came to him, and he was brought blind by the tail, was on the road begging. Jesus prayed for him. He said that I might see. Prayed for him. The man could see. All we got to do is just be simple. We don't have to be deep. You just simply have to believe that God can do whatever it is that you need God to do pertaining to a healing, pertaining to a miracle, pertaining to a promotion on a job. If it's a job that's persecuting you, treating you bad, and all the other employees are being treated good, and it's saying like you, you done prayed, and it's been three years you've been in that situation. Mm -hmm. But on that fourth year, on that three and a half year, somewhere along the way, God will shift it because you held on to believing that. Mm -hmm. He'll change it. And he can do the same thing with our life. So that's my whole point of what I'm trying to get you to understand. That our spirit, our spirit cannot and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Not by our mind, but we got to get the mind of Christ. Because that's the mind we want. We got to get the mind that God wants us to have. So God's purpose and plan is for me first to receive the truth. God's purpose and plan for me to change from my old ways and learn how to live to please him. Let's close it out with Ephesians chapter number 5. I have to, I have to identify what I'm ministering to you through the scriptures. If I don't do that, then I'm not, I'm, not, um, I'm not following God's instructions. Because he wants us to teach through his word. Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 1. We're going to read a little bit and we're going to close it out with this, okay? So we pray that you guys are opening up the scripture with me and that you are following along with me. Ephesians 5 and 1. And be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Now, again, he's talking to the church. But because he's talking to the church, he's still talking to unbelievers that really want to change their life. They have to make up in their mind they want to be one of God's children. In other words, to imitate Christ is to show that that's what God wants us to live and how to please him. Verse 2. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us. 
and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling Savior. When something smells sweet, that means it's satisfying. Yeah. That means it's acceptable. I love that phrase. So that's what satisfies God. When we offer ourselves as a sacrifice like Jesus did. But look at verse number three. We're talking about God's purpose and plan and what it is that we need God to help us with before we can walk in his purpose for our lives to please him, to represent him. Number three, but fornication and all, and all uncleanness, unpure things, fornication, sex outside of marriage, or satisfaction with yourself, however you want to put it, it's all sexual gratification is fornication. Or covetousness, just greedy, just everything you want, everything you can get. You don't care how you hurt people, what you do to scheme to get it, you just want it. Let it be once named among you as becoming saints. That means that something has to change in me in order for me to fulfill. This is God's purpose, first of all, his goal, first of all, the objective is for me to be changed. Okay? Verse 4, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, mm -hmm. nor jesting. You know, that's just joke, lying joking. It's okay to have some jokes with some laughter and fun with it, but to just be lying all the time, just joking and lying. So jesting, which are not coming in, covenant, am I saying that right? Convenient? But rather giving up thanks. You all follow along with me? Mm -hmm. Okay, verse 5. For this ye know that no homongers, now, in the context of me looking this up in the original word, homongers here mean male prostitutes. But homongers also mean anybody that's just giving themselves up freely. Now, no homongers, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an adulterer has any inheritance in the kingdom of God or Christ. I didn't say that. The scripture is saying that. Now, look at what he says right here because this is what the enemy works with. This is the order of the day, deception. Let no man deceive you with vain words, worthless words. Anytime people start trying to justify you can live any kind of way, anytime people try to justify that God is doing this because of this, God is doing that for that, and they don't have no proof of showing that God is showing you that in the scripture, it's empty, it's vain, it's worthless. That's what that means. With vain words are because these things coming from the wrath, the anger of God upon the children of disobedience. Now, you see what children we see there? We see the children of disobedience, and in verse 3, we see those as becoming saints. And we see also in verse 1 as dear children. Now, we get to verse 6, and it's talking about children of disobedience. Mm -hmm. So we are the one or the other. <coughs> we are the one or the other. Yes. We are either the dear children or we're the children of disobedience. Mm -hmm. So be ye, look at verse number 5. Now, Nanye, Kenye, Ezra, all of them, everybody that's here, from the youngest to the oldest, I'm hoping you follow along with me, and I'm hoping you really listen. Be ye not partakers with them. Somebody tell me, what is a partaker? Someone who is a partner. A partner. Goes alone. Goes alone. Goes with. Of death. So don't be a part of that crowd. Be ye not partakers with them. Don't participate with them. Don't don't. You can tolerate it, but you don't you you don't show tolerance when you when you join in with them. You have to be intolerant. You have to show them that I am not going to be a partaker of that. No, period. And these video games they got now, my God, even the basketball games, it make you feel like you're there. You playing basketball and people talking to you and you talking to them and you saying this and they saying everything seems like it's so real. And it'll just pull you in. But we can't be partakers with everything. Mm -hmm. Verse 8, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light, and the Lord walk as the children of light. So what I'm saying to you is, all I'm showing you is God's purpose and plan is not for us to be walking in darkness. He wants us to become children of the light. Mm -hmm. He wants us to become people that represent him. But we have to represent him first by individually making sure that we are following his plan of salvation for our life so that we can bring other people to Jesus. We want to be able to bring people to church, but we first want to be able to bring people to Jesus through drawing them through our life. Drawing them through our life. When, that, when you go places and somebody says something different about you than them, then that's, that's drawing them. 
And you might not even 100% be serving God to the fullest like you should. But you're, you're, you're going in that direction and somebody recognizes that. So see, even though they don't have the spirit of God, they know that your spirit is not normal and then you're not, they don't feel that you're really the same as like they are. They see something, they feel something different about you. Verse 9 of Ephesians 5. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So God's plan and God's purpose is for us to learn how to be in goodness His way. To learn how to be right His way. And to walk in the truth of His word His way. Amen. And this is what I'm doing. Verse number 10 right here. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. That's all I'm doing to you right now. This is what's acceptable to the Lord. And after he say, be not partakers, look at verse number 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, Amen. but rather reprove them, expose them. How do you expose them? By getting out of it. By, by not supporting it. Because it says in verse 12, it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done to them in secret. There's some things that I did in the world I wouldn't even testify on because it's a shame before God to even mention it again. But because God has a plan, God has a purpose for your life, he wants us all to understand that we have to do it his way. We have to go in water to represent death, burial, and resurrection. In Jesus' name. Not just in, you know, when the scripture said baptize him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Jesus come, he gave, that was actually the great commission. He was actually giving them their marching orders. He was letting them know what they were supposed to do in all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, I don't argue with people about any of that. Just simply say the name of Jesus. What do you have to lose? What do you have to lose just simply saying, whatsoever, the scriptures say, whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of Jesus. Acts 4 and 12 say, neither is there salvation in any other name whereby men must be saved. We can go on and on and on. So for me to, for me to take up 20, 20 minutes or hours with you, so you want to break down to me, in the name of the Father, I can show you what that means. In the name of the Son, I can show you what that means. In the name of the Holy Spirit, I can show you what that means. But we're really not going to get nowhere because the bottom line is, you don't feel like you have to say in Jesus' name, so, so be it. But I'm not going to stop presenting the prerequisites of what the plan of salvation is the way Jesus left instructions for his apostles to preach. Because now people are leaving all of these, all of these rudiments. They're leaving all of this basicness. Mm -hmm. But you have to be buried and warned and represents repentance when you go down in Jesus' name. So when you're buried, you're buried with him in baptism. You're going down and you're showing that you want to rise in the newness of life with the Holy Spirit. All of this is a whole <coughs> teaching all by itself. But I'm saying to you is real soon we're working it out where we will be able, if you want to be baptized in Jesus' name, mm -hmm. we are willingly going to allow you to go down in Jesus' name. I don't know how you've been baptized. I'm not trying to figure out how you've been baptized. But all I'm saying is the instructions that Jesus left was for everybody to repent, each and every one of you, Acts 2.38, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiving, for the remission of your sins. For the forgiving, for the remission. He tried to do a little something, a little, little any, okay. <laughs> you can do it. So he wants us to understand his purpose and his plan. First starts out with the salvation process. You got so many people that are talented. So many people that are gifted, they can just do all kind of things. But they are living how they want to live and not the way God has commanded them to live. I sound harsh, don't I? Well, read Matthew 7 and 24. I'm saying some things over and over and over so you can get it down in you. I think it's Matthew 7, 24, 23, somewhere in there. They're going to say how they prophesied in his name, how they cast out devils in his name, how they heal the sick in his name. Now, this is Jesus giving this example. This is Jesus saying, depart from me. So in the 21st century, all the way 2,000 years ago, he's saying the same thing. This is his process that he commanded us to go through. This is his process that he left his apostles to teach in all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. This is the process that after he rose and went up 40 days after that, they went back to Jerusalem, and Peter preached to those same people, the same Jesus. This is the same plan of salvation that pricked their hearts then. God is saying it cut them in, it made them feel bad then, and God is saying the same thing today. He wants you to do it this way.
So I'm praying that as you guys keep coming and you continue to pray.